living in a free country, we are reminded that freedom doesn't come for free. Men and women have given their lives so we can enjoy it. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll do that again. Living in a free country, we are reminded that freedom does not come for free. Men and women have given their lives so we can enjoy all the benefits that we now have. On this Remembrance Day, we are blessed and honored to have Maury Parsons with us, a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. As we listen to his story, let us be reminded of the values of fl- oh. <clears throat> living in a free country. We are reminded that freedom doesn't come for free. Men and women have given their lives so we can enjoy all the benefits that we now have. On this Remembrance Day, we are blessed and honored to have Maury Parsons with us, a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. As we listen to his story, let us be reminded of the values of life and faith and gain a deeper appreciation for those that sacrifice for our gain. Well, today we have something a little bit different. It is Remembrance Day today. And I had a wonderful opportunity to sit down with one of our own from this church, Mr. Maury Parsons. We sat down, yes, yeah. And, and uh, I got to sit down and, and uh, you know, we talked for about probably close to 40 minutes. And it's a time that I will always remember. It's a time that I will always cherish. Because I always look at the next generation, the generation that's gone before us, having experience and wisdom that I can take into my own life. There's always something that you can always glean from those that have gone before you. You know, Maury, it's great to have you with us today on Remembrance Day. I'm honored to be here. Yes, it's. uh, You've been glad to be alive and be here. (laughs) Yes, well, we're glad you're alive as well and that you're here. And and we're really look. I'm really looking forward to uh, this day and being able to speak with you. And how long have you been? part of Jubilee or even pre-Jubilee? Well, uh, my wife Joyce, who is a pastor here, uh, and I, I uh, in the early days uh, when uh, the church was on uh, 53rd Street. Okay. And actually, Joyce uh, was a regular attendee, and uh, of course that church metamorphosis, Phil came and several years later, Phil yeah. Mordine, and yeah. uh, took over as pastor, and then... Right. Uh, we followed Phil and Jubilee through the years as they, their path took them downtown and around and uh, right. until we moved into this facility. Right. Born in the U.S. Uh, okay. I'm a joint citizen, a uh, dual citizen now uh, because we've lived up here now for 40 years. But uh, uh, my dad was a pipeline engineer. We moved all around the country, so I really don't have a place to call home. Born in Kansas, out a prairie boy, uh, really. Out, born out in a farm... Uh, uh, on a gravel road where the doctor literally came in, uh, in a horse and buggy uh, to deliver me. Uh, but um, my, uh, I always wanted to be a fighter pilot. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I uh, remember the days reading the little uh, dime novels and uh, saying I wanted to be a fighter pilot. My older brother uh, was a Marine, killed in World War II, uh, enlisted at 17, uh, was killed before he was 21 in uh, the Pacific. And I think that uh, all led to my wanting to be uh, not only a fighter pilot, but a Marine. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that, uh, I, I'm proud to say that I uh, carried on that tradition uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, many of my family uh, members, uh, uh, particularly my nephews and nieces, are in the military, and, and I still have uh, a nephew who is a uh, who's a colonel, just about to make, make a brigadier general, and his wife is a retired lieutenant colonel in the uh, JAG. So the military runs deep within our family. Yeah. I think that's what I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, was fortunate enough to have a scholarship to, uh, to Stanford that uh, provided by the Navy, and uh, the obligation after the school was to serve uh, two years. This was when we still had uh, conscription uh, uh, so serving wasn't a, an option in those days. Uh, fortunately, I went through uh, Marine training, was co- uh, commissioned a second lieutenant, uh, briefly uh, was a platoon leader, and then uh, selected to go into flight school. My first uh, duty uh, in flight school was a beautiful city uh, called Pensacola. And that's where I met a beautiful girl hmm. who uh, became my wife. Uh, we've been married 
this December uh, 64 years. Wow. So uh, wow. she's been part of my military life. She's yeah. been part of my, uh, and, and since. When you're in the military, your wife and your family are in too. It's unlike most any other job or occupation. Uh, they uh, often, uh, you're living on base, uh, you're deployed for long periods of time away from home. Uh, mom has to step up as the leader at home. Uh, children have to learn to, uh, to deal with the fact that dad is uh, not always there at the right times. And uh, so when we think about the military, it's not just the, the guy in front, it's uh, his uh, whole family are serving. And uh, I think we need to always uh, think of that as we... Uh, I feel strongly that uh, the military provided uh, an atmosphere of uh, uh, and a learning curve that uh, I've appreciated the rest of my life. Uh, the things that uh, in, that you bring up, Dave, in your in uh, church every Sunday, uh, in, in the way you live your life is, uh, you know, honor. Certainly, uh, uh, that's a core of any marine or any one. Uh, Honor is an important element. Uh, courage, certainly. And courage is not just uh, is limited to the military. Courage is to face all the problems we face in life. Uh, mm. And uh, when I spoke of the absences and uh, yeah. the yeah, uh, it also has a, a sense of discipline, and that's uh, I think served all of us well as we think about uh, living our life. We learn to be disciplined, to uh, receive an order, and to give an order, and. Uh, Perhaps today's environment sometimes uh, doesn't necessarily uh, <laughs> accept that readily, but uh, I can say that uh, when you're in a situation that's stressful, uh, knowing that the people around you all are motivated the same way you are, mm. moving in the same direction, uh, has a, is a great lesson in life. Yeah. Post-World War II, and, uh, we, uh, we enjoyed a f a f several short years, and uh, then the... Uh, the Russian menace mm. came back. First, we had Korea. Uh, it, it was a war mar largely uh, supported with U.S. forces, although it was a U.N. war by, uh, carried on by the United Nations. Uh, but it was the first uh, effort of Russia using North Korea as a surrogate uh, to uh, start to make its inroads. We spent, uh, you know, two decades of Cold War, and during those years, uh, at least in the military, we sustained substantial losses, even uh, even though it was peacetime, uh, because we were always in a uh, an alert status, mm. and uh, that sense of urgency uh, pervaded everything. Of course, we, uh, also was the introduction of the nuclear age, and right. I think that impact. Uh, we remember uh, we had drills in schools where people were hiding under chairs. My squadron. Uh, the MF-214, uh, called the Black Sheep, we were the first uh, Marine squadron uh, to be uh, tasked with carrying nuclear missiles, nuclear weapons, I should say. And uh, I can remember that, uh, you know, we had, uh, while we were uh, deployed in the Far East for a significant period of time, we would have, uh, the uh, looking back, it's a scary proposition. Uh, look, we actually were targeting uh, targets uh, that uh, if in the case uh, things we would go had be pre-planned, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in retrospect, I don't think any of us uh, completely knew or accepted the terrible impact of nuclear warfare, and it still looms over us today. But uh, we shouldn't uh, deminimize that uh, any any war, significant war fought today, can take. Uh, uh, it can be here at home, it's not just overseas in the Middle East. Right. You know, the uh, life aboard ship, uh, I served on an air, uh, we were deployed on an aircraft carrier to the Middle East, excuse me, to the Far East for a significant period of time. And uh, I loved the life in the squadron. We were, uh, everyone, uh, uh, unlike civilian life, we, uh, we, we relied on each other. Uh, in the sense that uh, the, the leader of the squadron, he could be flying on your wing on a dark night where he was depending on you to uh, provide the stability and direction, and conversely, uh, 
you might be flying on his wing the next night. Uh, that created a closeness that uh, I've never been, uh, I've always, uh, I'm searching for the word, uh, uh, loved, uh, mm -hmm. remember fondly, mm -hmm. and uh, people relied on each other. And that, that relying on each other went right through the squadron because the wives collectively supported each other. You know, all the men were over us deployed. The wives were together as a group. They supported each other. During my uh, two years in that squadron, we lost lost two pilots, killed. Uh, I was in a serious crash and recovered okay. Um, the uh, you know it wasn't. Uh, remember, this is only 20, 18 pilots. So if you're losing two out of eighteen yeah. in two years, it's not insignificant. Right. The wives uh, the wives uh, collectively. Uh, uh, formed a strong unit, and uh, I, that, what I'm saying is that unity went right through the, the people, everyone that was yeah. involved. Uh, and I don't want to over-dramatize this, but uh, your success, your well-being, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, is dependent on each other performing their job. Mm -hmm. And certainly, it, uh, for example, uh, you know, the young 18-year-old mechanic working on your airplane, if he didn't uh, do a good job or left a nut uh, unfastened, uh, uh, could uh, cause a, uh, a terrible accident. Right. So that dependence on each other went right through the uh, the squadron, the, mm -hmm. the number of officers as well as you know the some 200 enlisted yeah. men who supported it. So, uh, and behind it all was the Marine Corps, and I think the Marine Corps itself has made its has a create has always created a unity, a pride, a trust, uh, respect uh, that uh, personally I think exceeds any other military unit. And uh, uh, actually, the Marine Corps was formed in uh, 1776. Wow. wow. So, uh, long tradition. Yeah, yeah. So, in, in, in all the years that you served and, and all these experiences that you had with these, you know, these the camaraderie and the closeness and the what would you say to us today who maybe are a little bit farther away from, you know, the urgency and the intensity of some of those things? And although there are, you know, some, some families that they've got kids serving right now or families serving right now, oh, what would be some things that you Dave, would... I think that's an important point. Remembrance Day, we think of the, the, the Flanders Field, the crosses and that. Uh, and we did. Uh, Canada, you know, uh, I think about people that I have met over the years. Uh, World War II, uh, men went to a war uh, overseas in 1939, didn't come home until late 40, into the 46th. Spent six years, mm -hmm. I think one gentleman, six years away from his family wow. uh, before he was, and uh, came back uh, wounded. Um, we, we don't want to forget that, uh, and uh, obviously remember state. Uh, but today, we should be also looking at, uh, with respect and uh, giving support to uh, our military, our military families. Um, we certainly still face uh, force, uh, outside forces, but you know the role of the military has been so critical to our, our daily lives. When there's a natural disaster, who do we call on? Obviously, the military comes to support us. When there are riots or uh, disturbances, they are there to reinforce our like police, our, our fire department, the other people who are standing at ready to defend yeah. ourselves. And um, we mustn't forget that we do have a military force. We do deploy those troops overseas, uh, you know, primarily in a peacekeeping uh, role in the past, but uh, in, in a frontline role as well. Uh, but I ask everyone to think about, to remember that there are people still in the military, there are still those military families, there are those sacrifices, there's that willingness to go out and uh, do the, the tough jobs that uh, are required. And uh, so Remembrance Day should be also thinking about what we have right now. Right. 
And uh, in this world of turmoil, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen next, uh, a resolute, strong uh, military force is a uh, critical role. Uh, it's unfortunately a, uh, it's, there are many c countries in the world who look upon military force as a weapon as opposed to a strength or a defense. And we have to face those realities. Mm. You know, I, I look at this helmet here and, and this gear that you've brought today and I think of all of the things that were going through your head while you were, you know, and all the stories and, and, and what have you. And, you know, we are, we are so honored to have you as part of Jubilee and to be here with us. And, and, and I want to thank you for coming today and just sharing your story and your thank heart. You. And thank you. You're obviously a man of honor, a man of loyalty as well. And, and we appreciate having you here with us, you and Pastor thank Joyce. And, and uh, thank you so much for giving us your time today. We, we appreciate you. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, appreciate the, I appreciate the opportunity to have been a Marine. We, we, should, we honor the past. We're thankful for the present mm -hmm. and we're hopeful for the future. You know, as I, as I watched that video and as I was listening, there were some things that Maury said that I just want to touch on today before we, before we dismiss. And, uh, and, and when I say dismiss, I mean like in an hour or two. Um, but no, no, just kidding. Uh, one, of, one of the things that you said, Maury, was the honor that you felt. You know, the, the honor that you felt. And... and there was just, that was part of the basis of the relationships that were there. That's what made things move. That's what, that's why men were able to stand in line and, and, and at, at a command be where they needed to be because there was that honor. There was that, that love for each other that came out of that honor. And, and, and uh, even when there was disagreement and when maybe not everybody was exactly on the same page, there was still that heart to serve and to get the job done. And I think in the body of Christ, it's important for us too to have that same type of honor, you know? And, and uh, I, I think of, it's interesting because when, when, when you read Paul in his letters, oftentimes we might be disconnected from the context that those letters are being written in. But you know, um, Jerusalem and, and Israel was under Roman occupation. So there was war going on all the time. Their lives were at stake just because of the Romans to start off with. But then when Jesus came and he introduced this kingdom of God, this new idea that God is a father, all of a sudden things changed. I mean, I can't imagine walking out the doors of this church today knowing that somebody might be ready right there in that moment to take my life simply because I believe in a resurrected Savior. And so the dynamic completely changed. And, and, and Paul was, you know, he was talking about, hey, if you're a soldier, enlist in the army, you don't get distracted by affairs. And he was using that in a term, in a context of our lives with Jesus. The fact that, we're sort of in a battle of sorts that we battle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and rulers. And that there is, there is an assignment of Satan to bring you down because Jesus Christ came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. And Jesus was that greatest demonstration of honor that any of us could imagine. The fact that he was willing to give up deity to become as we are, to live as we live to face all the temptations that we face, but yet he did it because he loved us so much. And he did it knowing that at one point he was going to suffer such an immense pain. But he did it anyways. And that was the honor that he displayed. And so, so when we think of the body of Christ, we actually in some degrees can take it in this context of uh, we are fighting for each other. We are fighting for, for uh, that abundant life that God has given us, that he, he, that he sacrificed his life for, that... Each and every one of us is, is actually uh, in an army of sort where Christ is the commander. And, and we're saying, okay, God, what is it that you'd have me do today? And those things don't get done without the honor for each other, and they don't get done without the honor for God, where he has priority. And, and that, that was part of the honor there, is the fact that you were, you were actually 
preferring those people beside you. I love the story that, that you told about how sometimes you'd be the guy with a wingman and sometimes you were the wingman. And that's the way we live our lives with each other and for each other. I got your back and sometimes you've got mine. And that's honor. It's looking at this whole idea that am I really willing to give my life and inconvenience myself to see you come through the hurt and the pain that you're going through? Am I really willing to give up some of my time and my convenience so that you know that you've got a wingman who's praying you through, who's going to be there for you when you need someone? And I think that's so powerful. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. And I think this is really one of the foundations of the gospel. Because the kingdom of God doesn't grow without honor. Even Jesus in his own hometown could not do any miracles because there was such dishonor for him. And I think of Jesus who was one with the Father, who walked this earth, and he heard the Father, he saw the Father. If he could not do a miracle in somebody's life because of dishonor, how much more do we need honor in our lives to see the grace of God increase and for people to experience the truth of who Jesus really is? Another thing that you talked about, Maury, was courage. That courage wasn't always having everything perfect. It was having that strength to step in it was to, to push through even when things didn't look like they were going to go well. You didn't have time to let the fear dictate to you who you were or what was going to happen. You knew the plan. You let it go and you stepped in that face and, and you overcame the fear. And that's what courage is. It's overcoming the things in our life, the fears in our life, and saying, God's calling me to grow. And it's going to take courage to do that. In fact, the word of God says that when we don't quit, when we don't give up, when we don't sit down and just pity, but we actually stand up and we push, it says it's a sign for our enemy that they've lost. And a lot of times in our lives, we face circumstances and we'll sit down and we'll quit, we'll give up, we'll isolate ourselves, we'll give up our hope. And that gives the enemy hope. But once again, we honor each other. We say, where are you at? How can I lift you up? Isolating yourself is the worst thing you can ever do when you're in a battle. So we need to have the courage, number one, to actually go to somebody and ask for help and say, hey, I need somebody to walk through this with me. But number two, we have to have the courage to say, the word of God is going to come true in my life. That the promises of God for me are yes and amen. And that will be my very source of life. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. I think that's a powerful statement. Let nothing move you. I think of all the times in my life where I let situations, words, thoughts, emotions become the very thing that dictated my next move. This doesn't just mean let nothing move you as in push you off your course. It means don't let anything else other than your faith in Christ be the very reasoning behind why you take your next move. Don't let the motivation of your move be from something that's other than faith in Jesus Christ. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. There's a lot of you in this church and you do things here, you do things out, outside of this church, ministry things, things that you do for God. And I want to encourage and honor you today by telling you that what you're doing, whether you feel it's insignificant, God says it's not being done in vain. You have to wake yourself up every morning and remind yourself that what I'm doing for God is not a waste of my time. That it actually carries weight in the kingdom. No matter what it is, if God's asked you to do it and you're doing it, it's not in vain. I think of the apostles when we talk about courage. You look at the way that most of them lived and then you look at most of their lives and how they ended 
There's only one person on this list here that died a natural death, and that was John. These men, some of them went to Asia, some of them went to where Russia is now, some of them were down in Africa, like Philip. But every single one of these men lost their lives because of something that they believed in that was so real and so deep. And we have to have the conviction because courage does not come without conviction. If you don't have the courage to stand up for Christ, it's a good probability that you don't have the conviction of your faith. Because people with courage are always motivated by conviction. So where's our courage? God's not given us that spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of power, love, and of sound mind. Walk in courage. The third thing you talked about, Maury, was discipline. This is one that you said, and I agree, we don't really like to talk about that too much. The fact that God would actually put a fire under our butt to get us to move. The fact that God would actually look at our character and say, you know what, I love you, but that's not okay. That bothers us today. But you see it throughout the scripture where God says, I love you, but that's not okay. In fact, the change in us will come when we're willing to be disciplined by God. And some of us see discipline as being abused. Some of us understand discipline as being beat up. That's not what I'm talking about. In fact, the word of God is very clear that it's the word of God that actually brings the discipline and the correction to our lives. Now, some of us, we don't like to listen. We like to do the hard way. So we end up in a situation that we didn't have to end up And then we say, well, God's teaching me a lesson. Well, no, it's just that this is what it took for you to actually learn your lesson. You could have had it another way. In fact, I believe it was Warren Buffett who said, the best way to learn is from other people's mistakes. But discipline is a powerful thing for our lives. And we have to open our hearts to say, God, would you correct me when I'm wrong? And he doesn't do it with condemnation. The Word of God says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But it also says, and goes on, it says, for those who walk after the Spirit, but not after the flesh. Which means eventually, if we keep walking according to our flesh, and we don't take the discipline and the wisdom and the instruction of God, we'll eventually come to a place of condemnation. And it's not God that's condemning us. It's simply because we've continued to walk that way. So God, would you keep us humble? In fact, one of the biggest things that God talks about oftentimes through Paul, is humility and laying down your pride in order to serve other people and to prefer them. Pride is one of the only things that I see in the Bible where it says that God will actually oppose you. We don't like that word. Oh, if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, God's very clear when he's with you and for you, and when he's saying, wait a minute, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and approve that path because that's gonna lead to destruction, and I'm not gonna let you go there because I love you. I don't let my kid walk out in front of a bus. Oh, you're so mean, you yelled at your daughter. Yeah, she was going to walk in front of a bus, but it's so, did you have to raise your voice? Oh, you don't love your daughter. How dare you yell at your daughter like that? Shut up. My love for my daughter will cause me to raise my voice, not in anger, but out of emergency and urgency, because I love her. And God says, I love you so much, I'll bring discipline to your life, I'll bring correction, I'll bring rebuke, I'll bring exhortation. And so you're gonna have to get used to that, because that's a lifelong thing. It's a promise from God. We don't claim that promise, do we? We don't promise that God's going to discipline us when we're off. We don't, we don't claim that, I know God will be there when I'm doing something wrong, and he'll, he'll, he'll tell me I'm doing it wrong. We don't claim that promise. But that's just as important as any other promise that we, we go. Your health, your life, your abundant, abundant life comes from the instruction of the Father. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
2 Timothy 1, 7, it begins by saying, the spirit, of God, that the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I don't know how often I hear that verse quoted when people are trying to say, hey, you know what? God's given me a spirit that requires me to have self-discipline. We usually say, oh, I'm not afraid. I don't have a spirit of fear. I'm not timid, right? But you know, the third thing there is just equally as important as the other two, which says, God's given me a spirit that calls me to self-discipline, that calls me to growing up and saying, if I'm gonna be strong and carry this fight, if I'm gonna move through this battle, and actually end up, because a lot of times men died in the war because of the fact that they were tired, they had lost focus, and they had let their guard down. I heard a story one time of a man who was in the middle of a battlefield, and he jumped into a big foxhole, a big pit, and as he jumped in, there was an enemy soldier, and for just half a second, he thought, Oh man, because the man was injured. And just for half a second, he waited. Guess what happened? He got shot and nearly died because he hesitated. And in the army, they tell you, you don't hesitate. When it's time to pull the trigger, you go. And if we're sitting here waiting on God to move, but we're not moving with him, that hesitation can end up causing us an injury that we don't want to walk around in life with. Sometimes the soul hurts that we carry are because in moments we knew God told us to do something, but we weren't disciplined enough to do it. And so a year later, we sit there and we say, oh, I wish I had done that a year ago. And it's only because he loves us. The word of God says, whoever heeds discipline shows the path to life. Whoever hates discipline is stupid. The Bible says that. So I guess it's okay to let your kids say the word stupid sometimes. <laughs> My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those who he loves. If you are not disciplined, then you are not, legit, then you are, uh, not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. It's a strong statement, isn't it? When you think about it, what it's saying is true salvation, which comes from the heart, is exemplified by this willingness to say, God, if you have to rebuke me, I'm open to it. And I won't let my feelings get hurt and get in the way because you have life for me. If I'm a son and daughter of God, my heart is to please the Father. He loves us no matter what. He loves us no matter what. All this is on that foundation. God will never leave us or forsake us. He always loves us. I had someone say, you know what? It doesn't matter where you've been. God's always proud of you. And that sounds really pretty, but you know what? That's not necessarily true. God will always love you. He's not necessarily always proud of us. And the reason why I say that is because God is always pushing us to something better for us. He's always pushing us to something that is better for us. And finally, the last thing that you said, Maury, was unity. There was unity. And I think this is so pivotal in the body of Christ. We live in a society where I, you, can easily become the very center and the focus of our universe, where it becomes about us, where it becomes simply about who we are and our convenience and our comfort. But when you're in battle, those are things that come secondary to being on the same page. And the Holy Spirit requires, and he's calling us. In fact, the greatest miracle of the day of Pentecost was not that people all of a sudden were starting to get healed. The greatest miracle of the day of Pentecost 
was the, unite, the uniting and the unification of hearts of people for one another. The fact that in this moment, when the Holy Spirit fell, they now started caring for each other. That they were on each other's hearts. Paul said, I have you in my heart. Paul spoke of many people in the letters. You know, sometimes we read the letters in the Gospels and we skip certain parts because we don't see the significance in them. But when Paul starts naming names about Epaphroditus, Apollos, and, 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 and other people, Timothy, what he's doing is he's expressing how much communion and how much camaraderie and how close they were, that they had become part of who he was. Paul prayed a prayer and he said, I actually feel your pain when I pray because I love you so much. I feel your pain because I love you so much. And this only comes from a greater experience and understanding of the Holy Spirit and God's love in us. Ephesians 4.3 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Every effort to keep unity. John 17.23, and I'll close with this verse, says this. It says, I and them, this is Jesus praying to the Father, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Why does God want us to be connected with him? So that we can be connected to each other. So that we can value the relationship that God has put here. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I've often read that verse as saying, well, God, would you make sure that they're in each other? You know, that there's that unity so that these Christians that they would know that you've loved these Christians as you've loved me. But when you read it in its context, this verse is saying that the world, those who don't know Jesus, through our unity would come to an understanding that God loves them as much as God loves the Father. There's a world out there that doesn't believe in Jesus. There's a world out there that misunderstands the grace and the goodness of God. And here Jesus is praying a prayer saying, God, would you make the church, would you make these that are around me that believe in me, would you bring unity to them so the world out there that misunderstands who I am would finally come to a place to realize that God loves the world as much as he does the believer. There is no us and them. There's Jesus and he calls everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son am i willing to sacrifice my convenience my personal gains at times to be unified with other believers so that the world out there would actually begin to understand that god loves them as much as he loves jesus that's a powerful powerful place to be. That's how the world's going to get turned upside down. That's how the world's going to get turned upside down for Jesus. Is when we walk in that unity. When we're one with God, where we are so close to God, where he becomes our passion. This is why we always have to question our passions. What is priority in my life? Because at the end of the day, if we really think about what we're called to do and the purpose of all the giftings and everything that God has given us, it all comes down to this one thing. How am I bringing people to God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit? Devoted to the word, committed to prayer, faithful in serving and generous in giving. These are the things that took that mission of God coming to people and people coming to God through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So on this Remembrance Day, when we remember those men and women who died so we could have a national freedom. Because the truth is, war is ugly all around. And no matter what side people were on, the good side, the bad side, the ugly side, the uncertain side, God loved them all. And it's a sad thing that millions of people have died unnecessarily 
because of greed, because of anger, because of resentment, and because of silly things sometimes as pride. And God loves every single human being that's died. And so that's where we as the church, we rise up with a kingdom cause. And we say that, yeah, we are in a battle. And we will remember those men that went before us, the apostles that were willing to give their life, beheaded, burned, stabbed, wounded, hung, crucified, upside down. We'll remember all of them and say, my life is a part of that. And I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to salvation. And that's what's going to win the war of the souls of men and women who God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give his life so that we could find peace with God. Amen? Let's stand. God, today... As we walk out of this place, we continue to remember and honor those who gave their lives for us in these natural wars. But Lord, we know that there is a battle for the souls of men and women. There are people out there, Father God, who have not had an experience with the Holy Spirit. They do not know who you are, God. They do not know your love. They don't know, they don't know God. And we're part of this group, this company, You've called us to honor. You've called us to have courage. You've called us to have unity and to be disciplined. Lord, would you be with us as we go out these doors? And would you remind us of the call of God on our life to bring people to you in the name of Jesus? I pray a blessing upon everyone here. Lord, I pray your protection. I speak blessing. God, I thank you that we are growing, that we are changing, that we are maturing, that we are, Father God, becoming more like you because there's a world that needs you. We love you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Have an awesome day. We honor all of you for all of you that love and serve. taking time to listen to today's message. If you are encouraged or challenged by what you heard today, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your story to mystory at jubileecalgary.com. You can also invest in the lives of others by partnering with us financially. Your gift can impact many as God works through your generosity to help us continue sharing this message with others. Donations can be given online at jubileecalgary.com backslash give. Your feedback and giving are truly appreciated.